get started. So welcome everyone. Welcome to today's podcast. Now today I'm actually going to be interviewing an amazing woman. Yes, another amazing woman. You've got to remember these things is uh, what I do is when I actually do these podcasts and I interview people, whether it's in the medical field, whether it's people helping others, um, you know, in the exercise field or whatever it is in nutrition. But I love speaking to women who've got stories to share with us. And today I want to introduce you to Penny Castlemay. Now, I'm going to read a little bit about Penny and I love the way that she spent, well, I don't love the way she spent 20 years, but I love the way she spent 20 years working for both the Fortune 500 companies and startup ventures. But after an ulcer, she actually left that and she walked away from there. And sometimes in life, that's what you need to do. Um, she also began her entrepreneurial journey. And a year later, unfortunately, she got diagnosed with breast cancer. Now, Penny is someone who was also uh, was also uh, diagnosed with BRCA2. And, um, and she'll talk a little bit about that. And now the thing is, she's obviously cancer-free uh, or in remission, which is great news. Uh, but I love the fact that she went and wrote a book and the title of her memoir is How to Get a Free Boob Job. Now, isn't that crazy? Because we all just <laughs> thought, one day I just want to get my breasts lifted, you know, That's or right. I want to get them bigger or smaller. So having said that, welcome, Penny. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with you and all of your listeners to this podcast. I know you have an amazing tribe of loyal fighters, warriors, women in the group. And I'm just excited to share my little piece of my story and um, chat and hang out for a little bit. Yeah, why not? So what is having said that, why don't we start by telling us a little bit about your story? Like, you know, take it away. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, I lost my mom when I was eight years old. So as you can imagine, um, being eight, I kind of, I don't have a lot of memories of her. Uh, I kind of don't even remember her really being sick. Um, but there I was, eight years old, lost my mom, um, grew up, had always been very uh, forthright with my doctors that I had lost my mom to metastatic breast cancer. So I was always on a path of vigilance when it came to my breast health. And um, although I was eight when my mom died, she died at the age of 32. So when I hit the age of 33, it was really sobering because at that moment I realized I had now lived longer than my mom. Uh, and then kind of keep moving forward. And at age 40, I said, I'm pretty sure I'm out of the woods, right? Like I made it eight years longer than my mom and I'm feeling good and everything is knock on wood, still going in the right direction in terms of health. Um, but then came along my 45th birthday and I heard those three words that no one ever thinks they're going to get delivered. And that was you have cancer. And uh, it was breast cancer. Completely threw me for a loop, um, brought back a lot of memories of denial, right? Like I thought I beat this because I had made it so much further past, you know, when my I had lost my mom. But I started approaching my diagnosis with the same approach I had used throughout my entire life. Um, and that was make a plan, do the work, check the box. And that is literally how I started down the path um, in tackling uh, my diagnosis was okay, uh, let's make a plan. Let me do what I can do, right? The doctors had their stuff to do. I could do some certain things for my health and then just keep checking the boxes. And it was kind of the same thing I did when I went to university college. And that was, 
I always knew I was going to get through high school and go to college. And that's kind of, I always knew I was going to get through my diagnosis and keep living the life I had envisioned. Now, of course, um, there were a lot of cogs thrown in my wheel as I was going through my diagnosis. And that was, we had no idea that my family had a malfunctioning BRCA2 gene um, in the mix. And so I was kind of the canary in the coal mine, as they say, and had to share that news with not only um, my immediate family, but also my extended family, um, so that everybody could kind of be aware and make decisions on their own if they wanted to get tested to see if they would be a carrier. But, um, you know, I was facing a small diagnosis of what I thought, you know, just breast cancer, right? Let's just treat the breast and move on. But coming to terms with having a BRCA2 diagnosis opened up a whole nother level of decisions that I had to make. So, um, so yeah, so what I thought was going to be kind of a, I don't want to say quick, but quick you know, treatment course turned into about two years of my life um, in treating and surgeries. Yeah. So, okay. So you were diagnosed, were you, um, were you going through your, uh, your year at this stage because you were in like, because your mom passed away, were you on a recall at all where you had to go every year just in case, you know, like you're in a higher risk. So therefore you're, you're going every year for a check anyway. Were you in something like that? Yeah, ab absolutely. So I was very forthright. As soon as I was able in the working force and had my own primary care physician as an adult in my 20s, they started me right away on mammograms every two years. Mm -hmm. um, and then because normally, at least here in the US, women don't usually start getting mammograms until they're late 30s, even 40 years old. But I had started to have them you know, in my 20s, which I was always thankful for. Um, I also was told early on that I had very dense breast tissue. And so I was very um, familiar with having a mammogram and then getting a report that said, hmm, we need you to come in for an ultrasound. And so when I got my last um, notice that said, yeah, can you please come in for an ultrasound? I thought, ah, here we go again, you know, been there, done that, just going to go in. And in fact, I had scheduled, um, I was actually headed out of town for a weekend and the clinic was en route to where I was going. So I was like, I'll just schedule it on my way out of town. Mm. That was a kicker because I was headed out to see some friends and um, I just kind of sat with the news all weekend long. I didn't want to share it with anybody. And so it was really kind of a reflective, pensive um, weekend spent out of town, um, you know, having to process all of that. Um, so, so yeah. Yeah. See, so, so, um, so was it, I'm just trying to understand. So you obviously didn't feel anything. No. You just went in for your, your general checkup and yes. bang, there it is. We found something. Yes. Uh, at what, because, okay, so you're now being diagnosed. Obviously, at what, uh, do you know what stage your breast cancer was diagnosed at? Yeah, it was stage one. Okay. And so you got stage one breast cancer and they go, okay, you hold the bracket two gene this is our next, uh, you know, attack. What did you have to do going from there? Like what, what was the next plan of attack? Yeah. So um, after I, I definitely had um, an appointment with a genetic counselor to get the testing done. And then when the test results came back, I went and revisited um, her office and we sat down and spent a couple hours going over all the statistics that were current and the statistics that were linked to different types of cancer that I now had an increased risk for. 
Um, and, you know, unfortunately today, or at least at the point that I was diagnosed, there's still no good way to determine ahead of time that you have ovarian cancer, right? So really she said with a very stern voice, she goes, the only recommendation that we have is that you get a radical hysterectomy because at, at the stage I was at, cause I was 45, um, they were just like, there's no test. By the time anything would be, uh, any symptoms would start presenting, you're probably looking at it being identified as stage four. And I actually had a very dear friend who didn't know, but she had the BRCA1 gene um, and hers presented as ovarian cancer and she fought it for five years. And then she passed, uh, ironically, uh, she passed away the she passed away the day before my birthday and the day that I actually quit corporate America. So on my last day in the corporate world, while suffering with an ulcer, I got the news that my good friend passed away and um, yeah, the next day was my birthday. So that was a very, uh, 2016 was a very, very um, crazy year. For me so like a tough year um so you went ahead and what did you end up doing did you end up you've had the so they've suggested you have the hysterectomy done you yes. had a did you have a double mastectomy done yes um and that was optional you know at mm -hmm. the time you know they said you can absolutely not um have both removed just know that if you choose not to have a mastectomy, a bilateral mastectomy mm -hmm, double, mm -hmm. that um, you are most likely, you know, when you look at the, when you look at the percentages, it's a high percentage that you will be diagnosed again in the future, um, whether it's in the same breast or the opposite breast. And I just, you know, it was that, it was at that point when I said, I don't ever want to deal with this again. And, you know, I understand that's such a personal choice for every woman to make, but from my vantage point, there is no parts on the inside of my body that I need in order mm -hmm. to continue and live a full life. And so I said, Oh, please just take them both off, take out, you know, I, I laugh, I joke with people that, um, outside of uh, me wearing makeup and my fake boobs, like I've, and my genetics, I've got no more lady parts left. Like they're all <laughs> off and out. Right. So. <sighs> well, but, who, ever, who would have ever thought, you know, uh, who would have ever thought that they, what a woman has can be so, not all women, of course, but how what a woman has can be so deadly to her at the same time. Does that make Please. sense? You know what I mean? Because it's like, well, hang on, you know, I was created. I was created because God or whoever you believe in created woman to be able to breastfeed. That's why we have breasts because we carry the child, you know, nurturing and things like that. Right. That's why we have the uterus and that's why we have the ovarians and da 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 da, da. so we can produce. So it's like a catch 22. It's like, well, hang on a minute. Yeah. See, I, I, I would like for you to reproduce, but Hey, these things can actually kill you at the same time. Take it's you like, out. <laughs> yeah. 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 They may just. Um, so having said that you've done the double mastectomy, did you have to do radiation or chemo as well? So the course of action that my doctors opted to take because I had made the decision to have um, a bilateral mastectomy was I would have chemo first to hopefully just, you know, obviously blast every cell in my body. And if anyone happened to get loose, that would take care of it, um, then do the surgery. So I did do chemo. I did 12 rounds of chemo. Uh, they were weekly. 
Um, and then I did not have to do radiation. And I was really hoping not to do radiation. Um, I had known someone in the past that had a, a different type of cancer that had radiation. And just like chemo, though, radiation just destroys your cells, right? It just ages you and, and it's painful. And I didn't want to go through any more than I needed to. So I was relieved to hear that because I made the decision to have both of my breasts removed, that they would not do radiation because radiation, I was told, makes it difficult to get the radiated uh, tissue out. So since I was having them removed anyway, there was no need for it. And so I did chemo. Then I had a six hour surgery because I, I laughed that I had a tag team of doctors that they just came out and they're like, high five, they're off, you're up next. And high five, they're out. And then the other person's like, high five, I'm going to go put some back in. Um, so I, I was, it was long for the people that were supporting me during this. But um, yeah, it was a six hour surgery where I had my um, breast removed, uh, my hysterectomy and the start of reconstruction. Oh, so. wow. You would have felt like very, very sore, that's for sure, for a <sighs> while. So <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> a little bit of painful. <laughs> um, yeah, like, well, that's that's pretty profound too because especially because I do hear that um, my surgeon actually mentioned that. She said that when people come in, to have a mastectomy done, the first thing they talk about is um, uh, whether they want to freeze their eggs if they haven't had children um, because of that because it could be, okay, you need to also have a hysterectomy done as well. So, um, yeah, I hear that a lot. I hear that a lot now because it's quite interesting because a lot of women who think, oh, it's just my breast, it's just my breast, but you know what I mean? It's It just, I think it works with both. You know, one yes. could affect the other. Yes. Um, so if your doctor does mention, of course, it's at the end of the day, it's up to yourself what you want to choose to do. But if the doctor mentioned it, um, it's because, you know, um, it needs to be done. But, you know, I, my surgeon didn't actually come down. that, And I remember saying to my surgeon, if you say we're going to do plan A, I'll say, right, let's analyse plan A and let's go with it. But if you say, let's not touch anything, I ain't touching nothing. Right. Unless it needs to. Unless it needs to. Um, because the thing is also um, you don't want to cause other problems for yourself. You know what I mean? Because yeah. you've now had the, you know, you've had the chemo. You've had the, the bilateral mastectomy. You've had the hysterectomy. Do, did you have to take medications? Like a lot of women have to sit on tablets uh you know uh chemo tablets if you want to call them that for a couple of years whether it's five years 10 years do you, are you on any medication like that as well yeah actually i so i'm actually on two medications right now um and what is so interesting to me is before i had cancer i just thought of cancer as cancer. Like when people talk about cancer, it sounds like it's a thing, like it's one thing. And what I can express is going, having gone through it, cancer is like Jenga. It's like one of those big wooden stacking block games. And, you know, are, we can both have cancer, but mine is missing the block up here and you're missing a block down here. And the way that you treat those is so, so different. Um, so for the drugs that I'm on, what was so fascinating to me is that, you know, data continually comes in to medical research um, foundations, and they're constantly combing over profiles and year, you know, statistics one year out, two years out, three years out, and so forth. And just from the time that I was diagnosed to 18 months later, there was enough data to support that women with my specific 
genetic profile benefited from having an infusion of a biphosphate, which is usually for people going through osteoporosis. So a biphosphate is an infusion that helps calcium get into any holes in your bones. And I'm not a medical professional. I could completely be botching this up, but that's pretty much what the biphosphate does is it pushes calcium to strengthen your bones. Um, and the reason I'm getting that is because they found that um, breast cancer cells like to migrate to two specific locations in the event they get out and decide to take a tour of your body. And one of them is your largest bone, which is your femur and your brain. So uh, that's why the biphosphate, they found that women who received an infusion could reduce their recurrence rate by an additional percent. And so when my doctor told me this, I said, sign me up. And it was so funny. He looked at me, he goes, I didn't ask yet, but okay, we'll go ahead and sign you up. Um, so I, it, that's a three year treatment. And this fall, I'll have my very last infusion for the biphosphate. Um, and then my type of cancer was hormone dependent. And so I am on a tablet um, that suppresses any further naturally occurring estrogen and tries mm -hmm. to keep that as low as possible. And, you know, I don't have my ovaries, those aren't producing estrogen, but our bodies, even without ovaries will do that. And so they try to keep, they want to keep it as low as possible because my type of cancer feeds on mm -hmm. um, estrogen. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, and having said all of that too, then is, um, you know, so uh, then I guess my next question is how do you, if I can ask this question, as a woman who's gone through all of this, how do you, how do you go through this and still feel good about yourself, still feel sexy, still feel vulnerable? Because we're talking the external is one thing, but now we're talking about playing around with your, you know, because uh, obviously you don't have menopause, you don't, you didn't, you know what I mean, premenopause, postmenopause, um, all of this stuff, um, perimenopause. I love that one. You know, you well, don't I, have all of that. Yeah. So I'm. I I was very. So technically, I am in full menopause, but they call it medically induced menopause because my body did not naturally go through the process that yeah. most women will experience, like you said, with perimenopause and things like that. So literally the day I went in for my surgery, I was allegedly, I don't think they did any definitive tests, but I was operating at full capacity. And then immediately after surgery, I was in menopause. I mean, that's, and in fact, that was one of the first questions um, after I came out of surgery and had recovered the next morning. You know, I, I had three surgeons the day before. I had a plastic surgeon, um, a gynecological oncologist, and then um, a, another oncologist doctor that took, I had a doctor that took off my breasts, a doctor that put them back on for reconstruction. And then I had my um, gynecological doctor. The next morning, they all made their rounds with residents and, you know, one, one group at a time would come in and my gynecological oncologist said, are you experiencing any hot flashes? And I looked at her and I went, not that I'm aware of. And she goes, that's great. Because if you haven't had one yet, you're probably going to be good for the rest of your life and not have them. And I just went, yes, you know, I'm sitting in, in the hospital, <laughs> right? After six hours of surgery and I'm sitting like, yes, I don't have hot flashes. Now, having said that, I have found that if I eat too much sugar, um, that can kind of make me a little hot. So like a big bowl of ice cream or <laughs> birthday cake, I'll eat it and I'll be like, 
Whew, this is a little hot. <laughs> it's a little hot in here. <laughs> it's a little hot. I guess I ate too much sugar. So, uh, well, you got to look at the fun side of things, you know. Uh, but you know, it's true though because exactly that, you know, because now you're you're dealing with this. Okay, I'm dealing with the breast being taken off. I'm dealing with the new breast coming in. You know, making residents, uh, and now you know. I don't have the yay bonus. I, I got told I'm one of these bleeders, which oh, it devastated me when I got told that, oh, no, you're one of these people they are going to have your period for a while. I'm 50. I'm like, oh, you're no. Like, no, really? Yeah, yeah, so not what you want to hear, but at the same time it's all natural at this stage. But, um, but at the same time, so now you've had the operation, you had all of that, and now you're sitting there going, okay, I don't have – I went straight into menopause. But again, it changes your emotions. I believe it, it does. It changes your emotions because, like you said, it's medically induced now. Um, you're not going through all the physical things like the whole flushes and all of that. But, you know, emotionally, what are you going through? What are you going through emotionally? Do you, did you feel that there was a, sh a massive shift or not really? That's a really good question. Um I I don't dwell too much on things like that. Um, I just, again, like, I just can't stress enough. I think it was a huge influence from my dad growing up. I love to do DIY projects. And that is definitely how I spent my youth growing up was helping my dad with projects throughout the house. And that's kind of how I moved forward with my cancer diagnosis. You know, it, I looked at it as a project, right? Like all of a sudden, you know, it could be, I have, I have cancer, so let's make a plan. Let's do the work and let's check the box. You know, it's the same as if you had a pipe that was leaky. Okay. Have a pipe that's leaky. Let's make a plan to fix it get the right tools, check it off and move on to the next project. So for me, that's kind of how I have moved forward uh, after my diagnosis, during my diagnosis is it's a project. I'm a project, right? I had cancer, did the work, check the box, moving on. I was not in menopause. I'm in medically induced menopause. I have, you know, symptoms that women deal with at times, have to figure out how to deal with them and move through and keep going. And so that's, that's really kind of how I look at things. You know, it's there, don't get me wrong. There are absolutely days where I get really pensive about my body and what I have because I, my breasts are never coming back, right? Um, and really no one outside of, well, I suppose you could say the entire world knows that my boobs are not real because I wrote a book about it. However, if you just passed me on the street and you didn't know I wrote the book, uh, no one would be the wiser that I don't have real breasts. They look just the same as any others under a shirt. Um, but when I'm with myself, I know they're not the real thing. And, you know, sometimes I do have a little mourning, like sadness. Um, about it, but I would not want them back for mm -hmm. any amount of money. Like, you know, the minute yeah. I might, you know, I, I, I let myself experience the sadness, but then I'm like, I, I woke up on the right side of the ground today and right there is reason to celebrate. And I just, looking to be like, thank you, Just move on. So Absolutely, absolutely. I agree with you because 
you know, there's all these, I, I love the fact that, you know, there's all these T-shirts that say, yes, my real ones tried to kill me, things like that. Um, but it's true, of course, if it's it's like anyone even had a, you know, God forbid, has an infection and has to have an amputated arm or leg or foot or fingers, whatever it is. I mean, I guess when you think about, okay, I've got to lose my fingers and I've got to learn how to deal with it and how to use my hand in a different way or whatever it is, you know what I mean? You, you adapt, you adapt, you go through it and you adapt. And like you said, yes, you're going to have your moments of sadness, of loss, um, but then you're going to, re- you know, you realise, you think, well, hang on a minute, had I chose to keep them, it may have ended me a lot earlier. So let's go on to your book. So you call your book How to Get a Free Boob Job. And I thought that is the funniest because, <laughs> you know, you get all these women who, like, I'm one of these women, like, uh, you know, my, my breasts aren't exactly perky and sitting upright, you know. <laughs> So I always lift them up and I always go to my husband, what if I just lift this up and have them like that? And he's like, you're not doing anything. And I'm like, but I just want them lifted. I just want them lifted to the point where when I went in for um, the lumpectomy done, Uh my surgeon said, oh, by the way, Grace, I I sort of gave your boob a little bit of a lift. And I thought, why couldn't you go in the other one and do the other one? I mean, I'm not. I would have slipped you 20 bucks on that. No, I would have. I mean, it's not really dramatic, God forbid, if what you know, but she said, Oh, well, I was there. And I thought, and you couldn't do the other side. So it's true, because you get these women who, you know, they talk about, oh, if only I had perkier boobs. If I, you know, my my sister was one who always had breast implants and her breasts were always sitting up and she could wear these strapless clothes. And there's Grace that if she hasn't got it taped up, you know, with duct tape forget (laughs) it they're down to her knees you know so there's no strapless sort of top or anything but you know and it's true a lot of people are saying you know oh well it's going to cost so much money to get a boob job and you name your book how to get a free boob job now what was the concept what was the concept why why do you believe for yourself like I want to write this book what was your idea behind it Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So I have to say that writing a book was never on my bucket list. It was never a dream. It wasn't even a glimmer in my eye when I started down this path. Um, I had always believed that I was not good at writing because of English, right? And all the course, you know, English classes and papers I'd have to write, all the academic, um, the academic side of writing, because that's all I really knew. So I never journaled, I never did anything growing up other than what I had to write for school. And I never got A's on what I wrote. So I never believed that I could. But what I found when I immediately, like, immediately after I got my diagnosis, I just kind of sat back and thought, how on earth am I going to share this news with people? Because I knew I did not have the capacity mentally and even physically to get on the phone with all the people that I wanted to share this with. And so I started doing updates and there is a site. I don't know if it's available worldwide, but at least here in the U S it's called caringbridge.org. And it is like Facebook, but it's for people going through any type of health crisis. Um, And I could be very selective in who I allowed into my page for updates. So that's, that is really how my book started. I would every time there was a development or something new that I learned, I would sit down in front of my computer and send out a post just like you do on Facebook to all the people in my group. And it did not take long from doing that, I was getting texts, I was 
you know, people would call me and they're like, Penny, oh my God, I was reading this. I was in tears. Then you had me laughing and you're such a good writer. And I thought, okay, these people are just saying this because they love me and no other reason. But as people started getting added in, I added some people that weren't as close in friends and family into the group. And even they were saying it. And so after about two, three months, I thought, okay, apparently I can write, um, especially when it's not academic. So I, by the end of my journey, so I had done updates for more than a year. Someone said, you should write a memoir because you could help so many people who are facing the exact same thing as you are because you are so graceful and so um, empathetic and funny. I mean, that's what they just kept coming back to. They're like, Penny, I don't know how you stay so positive and I don't know how you can face this with so much humor, but you really need to share this. So they suggested I write a memoir. Side note, I had to look up what a memoir was because I did not know. So um, <laughs> I took all, I know that, I mean, this just shows you how much of a non-writer I am. I didn't mm. know what a memoir was and I had never even read a memoir. So this book was just my take on a memoir. Um, but I had taken all of those updates and I put them into a Word document and that clocked in at about 45,000 words, which is more than more than halfway to having a book. For those people who don't know how many words are usually in a book, I didn't know either. So I thought, oh my God, I'm halfway there. Like, just finish it out. And so I just needed to fill in uh, some narrative to help people like yourself, like your listeners who didn't know me from the time I was a child and didn't see me go through everything um, in order, filled in some narrative so that my entries that I had shared with my close friends and family made sense. And so once I did that, voila, my memoir was complete. And there's even pictures, because I like pictures in books. So there's even some pictures to keep people entertained and <laughs> engaged with my writing. Well, see, I love that too. I love the fact that, yeah, I, 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 I thought that as well, because it's like, I, I do a lot of reading. I love reading and autobiographies and memoirs and things like that are honestly, I've got bookshelves downstairs full of them that, you know, you can give me a book and I'm like, it takes me a while to read. You can give me an autobiography and I will read it in two days. I will just, like my husband says, I'll see you in, are you reading an autobiography? Yep. I'll see you in two days because I just read. Because <laughs> what happens is, and this is why, like a lot of people are like, well, why it, are you are you purchasing these books for research? No, I'm not. I'm purchasing these books for my own because what I mean by that is everything that I've read so far, and I can't wait to read your book, I get pieces of it for myself to help me. I learn from others. I learn from others. And that's what I use. But, you know, and, and the thing is with that is it also allows you to step into that place. It's like, it's like I'm watching you. I'm in the corner of a room and I'm watching you. I feel like you're really watching what the person went through because the medical terms, like, you know, like I know everyone talks about it. Oh, yes, we did chemo. My hair fell out. I had no taste buds. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, but that's the medical term. I know that and I didn't even go through chemo. So 
what did you go through? What did you go through psychologically? I've always been interested in that. <laughs> you know, what did you go through emotionally? And, and you know, and like you said, you make fun of it and you can make fun of it because you yeah. went there. You're not making fun of cancer and, and being disrespectful to right. others. You're making fun of what you went through. Yeah. We can all do that. You know what I mean? Like I, I even made fun of what I had, I went through, you know, uh, and it wasn't even that dramatic as much as I'm not here to compare apples with apples, oh. but you know what I mean? But it, it, it's just so interesting. But then when you get a book that's got pictures, it's like, oh, I get to see what Penny was, who Penny yeah. is. That's what I believe. And this is why I do these podcasts, because if I try to do this, medical jargon where I'm not a professional medical doctor or anything, people disconnect. Yeah. So that's why I like people who are true. This is what I went through. This is my story. And my yeah. mentors always say, your mess is your message. Yeah. You have to share it. Yeah. So I love the fact that you put pictures in it. I can't wait to see it now. <laughs> <laughs> It's like now I get to see Penny. Oh, look at her. Look at I her. know, she right? Like oh my goodness. <laughs> there are so many. There are so many. There I mean there's 10. I think there's 10 pictures in there. Um but yeah, they run the gamut cuz I put one in there when I was um a little like a baby, like little nugget <laughs> on my mom's arm. Um mm. and then one where I was bald and yeah, you'll, you'll get a whole little glimpse into the, the two years that, uh, and proceeding that I had this, but I will tell you that the original title that I started with was mm -hmm. choose courage mm. because I just thought everyone kept telling me I'm so, you know, I'm so upbeat. I'm so, you know, how do you, stay that. And I'm like, I'll just call it choose courage. And oh, Grace, I can tell you by the time I reached the end of the book, I looked at that title and went, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> like, I cannot get behind. I cannot stand in front of anybody and say, here, you should read my book, choose courage. Not that that's a bad title. It, it was so disconnected from the tone of my book that I went, I can't, I can't. And I landed on how to get a free boob job in less than a day because I thought it was funny. I think I'm funny. And I said, I can absolutely hold this book up with confidence and conviction and say, yeah this is my book. And so, wow. yeah. Yeah. Well, see, and that's what I love because also, you know, because someone could say a word and yes, it means something to every, someone else, but if it's not coming from your soul, if it's not truly oh, who you are, absolutely, it, it doesn't resonate. Like I've always used the term journeying, journeying. Your life is a journey. It's not about the destination. Your life is a journey. Your life is a journey. So breast cancer hero's journey, because I always believe we're all heroes of our own journey. I always went through that. So hero's journey, you hear it, it's everywhere. So I'm not the first one to use it. But I thought, but that's what I always talk about. So it felt natural to call it Breast Cancer yeah. Hero's Journey. But before that, I had, uh, oh, geez, I could have had Breast Cancer Survivor and all of this. And I right. thought, I never defined myself as breast, you know, I never let breast cancer define me. So I'm like, mm. exactly. you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a breast cancer survivor. I'm a life survivor. If I had a microphone, I would drop it right now for you. But I do not. So we'll just have to have the fake Boom. one. Boom. Boom. But you That's get what I'm stuff. saying? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I do love the fact that you just said hero, right? Mm. Because when we're going through it, and regardless of what stage you're in, you are someone's hero. I, I, I really believe that as women, as we move forward through 
such, you know, a devastating diagnosis, right? Like nobody wants to hear they have cancer, especially as a woman. You don't want to hear you have breast cancer because that's what's the defining feature of women. Really, when you boil it down, it's breasts, it's boobs. Absolutely. Um, And so as we're going through this, for me, and I can imagine many women in the same situation, you turn so internal. Everything becomes about you. And it's often very hard to look outside of yourself as you're going through some of these big treatments and decisions and surgeries. But once I found myself beyond that point, to your point, we are someone's hero. We are someone that people were looking up to, who were, we were being cheered on um, as we went through this. And so I love the title of your podcast. I think it's, (laughs) it's awesome because it's, it's so true. And um, so my spin on the whole journey um, for me, it, it felt not exciting enough to say I was going on a breast cancer journey. So the subtitle of my book is, and so the title is how to get a free boob job and other insights from a breast cancer adventurer because that is really how I viewed what I was going through it was an adventure because this was not um, as much as yes I will be dealing and monitoring my health for the rest of my life um, since coming out of this um, yeah adventure but it you know it was like a certain point in time for me right? Like the heavy lifting, the, the diagnosis, the procedures, it was a specific point in time. And so that's why I called it, it was my cancer adventure, because I'm it. hopefully on the other side of things and, you know, can look, look back on it as that as a big adventure that I went on. Well, life is an adventure, isn't it? Like yeah. we're saying, it, it's a, it's not about the destination. A lot of people go, oh, in five years when I get my dream house or in three years when I get my car or in, in two years when I go on that holiday, it's not about that. Yes, it's going to be beautiful, but how many people get there and go, oh. Well, exactly, that- exactly. Yeah. So it's not about getting it. Like you, you dream about this car for so long and you get in there and the leather smells beautiful and you're, oh my God. Guess what happens by day three? You're jumping in, you're ta- it's taking you from A to B. It's not that you don't, you're not proud of how far you've come. Right. But if you look back, And you go, wow, oh, I remember that. Yeah, that guy, that first guy when I wanted to buy that car, he told me I'll never become anyone. Look at that. And I remember going to this. It's the adventure because that's what you appreciate after. And and the the adventure is life. Life is an adventure. Take it. Because there are women who I speak to are 25 years cancer-free, fantastic. But that's because you you put yourself in that category and it's not a bad thing you know like oh yeah breast cancer survivor 25 years right but the poor girl could get run over by a tractor on her way to a farm or you know what I mean it's like yes what you know what I mean you're not gonna know her as oh yes there there goes Sally you know she was 25 years cancer free Mm -hmm. You're going to go, there's Sally. She was an amazing woman. She lived her life, da, 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 da. She did this. She tried that, da, da, da. You know what I mean? So it's great how you put that as an adventure. I really, really love that because we're here to inspire others. We're here to inspire other women. Look at us. Right. It's okay. Don't look at it. Look, we were blessed. When I say we were blessed, we were blessed 
We were found early. We did what we had to do to recover earlier. I get it. There are women who unfortunately don't get the diagnosis we did, stage one or whatever. But even there, see, there's the difference. I'm stage one. You're stage one. But you're totally way. Oh, yes. <laughs> you get what I mean? I'd never had, Grace, you need to get rid of both breasts. You need to have a hysterectomy. You need to do chemo. You need to. to, to. Right. So you can't, like you said before, you're, you're like that game. Yep. Django. So you can't say we're the same. Yeah. But if anything, we're here to inspire women. It doesn't matter what stage you are. Live your life. Yeah. Live your adventure. Absolutely. I really love that. I really love that. Uh, and, and going on to that, like, you, you you know, some of the thing is what are some things that women can do to actually, like, you know, um, have more confidence in themselves? Like I, I believe confidence is a main thing. It's not about, uh, I don't know if this happened to you, I got confident. It, it's like when I got diagnosed with breast cancer, of course, you like you said, you get those three nasty words, you have cancer. And it's game over. So for the first couple of days, weeks, hours, whatever it is, you're in this bubble. You're, it's surreal. Yeah. But then you become empowered within yourself. You start to have a shield where you say, right, I need to now protect me and I need to now go through this. I can't turn my face. I have to have the confidence. I have to look at it. So you say, so how do, How would you, what's your top tips for someone to have a beautiful, like more confidence in their life? Wow. Can I say I don't know that I figured that completely out yet? <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. But no, the thing no, is yeah. Um, I, I just, a, a lot, so probably about 10 years ago is when I really started um, to explore personal development and um, ways that I could better myself as a human. So I've always loved learning, but it had always been academic. So I, you know, went to high school and I knew before I even graduated high school that I was going to college because that's what I was going to do. And I did it. And then after I went to college, I said, okay, I'm going to get a job. And I did. And then I was in the working world for a year. And I came home one day and I, I, was, I was living alone, came home did the normal dinner routine, sat down, um, turned on the television and was going to watch a show. And all of a sudden, I, I really don't know what light switch happened, but I went, there has got to be something else for me to do. Like I cannot imagine going to work, making dinner, watching TV. And I mean, to me, that was just like a nightmare groundhog day. Uh, and I thought, I can't do this. I need, I need something new. I have to stimulate my mind. So then I went and got a master's. So that helped me for three years. But then again, uh, the same kind of feeling started to, to bubble up. And I said, okay, I cannot keep putting myself through more school. It's just, um, it's not financially feasible. It's not um, energetically feasible. So I happened to um, stumble across some really good personal development books and authors and started to go down that path. And I really do believe that that helped set me up for the resilience I would need coming out of cancer and through dealing with it. Um, like I said, I had never been a writer up until that point, but I did find that writing was a huge 
release for me um, during my cancer. And it really did give me more confidence because I could take all of the thoughts I was having in my head and get them out and onto paper. And what that did is just help me keep things in perspective Mm -hmm. because too often we let things rumble around up there and it is like a pinball machine, right? I mean, it is things going left, right? We don't know where it's going. Flippers are tossing it up again, but getting it out and putting it words was really cathartic. It just kind of Mm. helped with the release and put me in control because now I was writing what I was thinking, right? So it was like, I'm the one controlling the words on the paper. Mm. They weren't bouncing around in my head anymore. I was the one controlling where they were going. So I, I do think that my writing, which is reflective in my book, was such a huge um, confidence stake that I put in the ground during my journey Um, and gratitude, right? I mean, it does not take much to realize. And, and there's a very, there's a small little story in my book, but I'll give you a little, a little glimpse into it where um, I had to have a serious conversation with a jar of jam (laughs) <laughs> and um who won <laughs> uh the jar <laughs> the jar won uh but you know really i mean it, i think that was like one of the first points where i went wow do i have so much to be all, all the things that i just waltzed through my day and did suddenly had a different level of difficulty during and really after some of my big surgeries. Um, And it's like, whoa, okay, time out, right? Let's move forward with gratitude and grace. Mm -hmm. And those two things combined really helped with my confidence because it was, you know, giving, giving myself the grace to say I need help or giving myself the grace to take my second nap of the day Um, and gratitude for all these little things that I would never have given two thoughts about. Right. So those two combined really helped me stand in confidence that not only had I done the right thing, but man, was I well equipped to move forward. Wow, that is so, and it's it, it is we you don't sometimes life is ruffling us so much that we think that the external things will make us happy, and like you said, it's the smallest things, the gratitude. It's the smallest things, like you said, having that second nap, or just opening your eyes to the world. You know, like opening right. your eyes in the morning. Little things are that we should be grateful for. But touching on your book, because you said that you were journaling and everything like that, um, when you were writing your book, I'm not sure if you used as as a reference some of your journals and things like that, but were there things in your journal that you thought, oh, this is still an open wound and not a scar? Does that make sense? Where an open wound is, oh, this is really affecting me. I still can't talk about it because it's just too fresh. Did you ever come across those in your in your writing? I it brought so so what I will say is yes. So I lost my mom mm. like I mentioned at the age of 8. And when you're 8 like you can't process everything. You know, one day I had a mom, the next day she was gone, right? And I didn't see it coming. Maybe people talked to me about the impending event, but I don't recall, right? So a lot of things were bubbling up for me. Um, And I also had to deal a lot with 
being the only person so far uh, in my family of those who have been tested who got the gene. And so that was kind of a, another layer to kind of wade through. So I think both of them were more so mental hurdles, mental open wounds that I had to move through and process and sit with and make peace with um, that I didn't, I didn't think I would have been upset or mad about, but I was hmm. certainly had definite moments of massive sadness hmm. um, because I had realized what I went through um, with my cancer, my mom's treatments and options, f- barbaric. I mean, I, it, it's kind of, that's the only word I can describe when I hear mm-hmm. some of the things that my mom had to endure to fight her mm-hmm. fight. And I think, good Lord, did I have that easy? You know, and who says that, right? You're going through stuff, mm-hmm. but upon reflection. And then, you know, just dealing with <sighs> anger is probably not the right word. I'm, I'm not a word smith per se but you know like really i'm the only person in the family who got this really it's i know it's a roll of the dice but i was just like god that that was hard like i'm not gonna lie if my family's listening sorry yes i may have been mad that you didn't get it and i did (laughs) but um (laughs) i know what you mean though but i've kind of you know i've had uh, enough time now to make peace with with those and because there's nothing I can do either one right just sit with it mm. have gratitude have grace and move forward because I want to I want to lead a pretty kick in life for the rest of the time I've got I mean, and you don't want to stay in the past and that, and I love that, you know, you take what you need from it to move forward right. um, and you learn and you say, right, you are my past. I'm not trying to avoid you. I'm not trying to pretend you never existed, but I'm now moving forward. And it's really special, like you say, because, you know, that's where sometimes I've got so many journals Um uh, because a year prior to my diagnosis, uh, I was also on the brink of separating with my husband. You know, we were very much on the way out. Both of us, um, we're still, we're actually stronger than ever today. But there's a lot of stuff I wrote through that. Yeah. <laughs> behave, behave. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but we're stronger than ever. But there was so much stuff in that, in the journals that I think, Ooh, you know, am I ready to read that? But having said that, I, I remember reading one part of a journal and I just spoke so bad about me that it was so bad that I was choking how much I was laughing. Right. And my <laughs> husband's going, oh, that's really sad. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, Grace, what were you thinking? I'm laughing. And my husband's like, you actually wrote that about you? Like he was more sad that I wrote that about myself. And I'm laughing thinking because what does it do? Because it shows you how much you've grown. It's showing you how much you've moved forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it it was scary to sit Mm. down and start journaling. Or, yeah. or even writing my updates. I mean, again, I had it in my mind that I was just a bad writer. And so mm-hmm. the last thing I wanted to do was sit and write updates about this diagnosis I was just given and then take time to journal about it, right? I, there's so much resistance in, in moving forward in both of those areas. And I have to say that it was probably, well, the best thing 
that I could have done for myself. Because again, you know, it's so funny. They say the power of the pen, right? But boy, writing that stuff out, you know, if you're having a bad day, you're journaling. There were probably times I almost pushed the pen through the paper, right? I was just so angry and needed to get it out. But once that happened, ah, you got it out, right? You got it out of the pinball machine and down where you could manage it and look at it. And ah, this is a beautiful thing. You can close your journal, right? You could get it out of your head, put it on paper, and then shut it. And just set it aside for a while, Mm. right? That is so profound. Mm. Shut the cover and put it aside. And to your point, pick it up when you're feeling settled Mm. and and, uh, give yourself perspective, right? Oh, because a lot of people forget how far they've come. You know, even these journeys where people go through breast cancer and all that, like I – you know, there were days where I would be like, oh, yeah, well, I survived breast cancer. It's like, Grace, you didn't just survive breast cancer. Look at all the things you've done since. And it's like, oh, yeah, I did do that. Like it's not just physical things. It was, it, It's the transformation within that I went through that it's like, oh, yeah, I've come so far. It's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. You forget. Yeah. You forget. Yeah. You know? Wow, yeah. that's just I love it. I love it. So um obviously when you're not fighting the big bad cancer man or cancer woman or whatever you want to call it and you know you're not writing best-selling novels or memoirs in this case. <laughs> so you're I love how you had a 100-year-old tu- uh now Tudor? Tudor. Yes. Say say it. Tudor. I ho in I I ho Am I saying that oh, wrong? So, hi, oh, hi. Oh, hi. Oh, if my husband was hi, here. Hi. Oh. Hi. Oh, if my husband was here, he'd just slap me because he's <laughs> like, how can you say it like that? Um, I think my husband's more American than he is Italian sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're if you're not fighting the big bad wolf at the door or anything like that, it says that you're actually or mixing it up with clients, that you're actually out there doing DUI. And I thought that's really great. But Wow, that's that is in, interesting to live in such an old home. Are you are you D, DIYing that house now, or is it fully renovated, or what are you doing there? Yeah, yeah. So actually, I just finished uh, renovating um, a bathroom. Now, with the caveat that the person who owned the house before me had done some major bring it into the 21st century, right? So I was not looking at, you know, replacing a toilet that had like a pull handle or something strange. Um, I still have the original tub that's cast iron that's in the bathroom I just remodeled. But um, most of the things I do aren't really that techy. Um, I can do electrical work when it comes to just swapping out a fixture. So if there's one already on the wall, I can take that one down, wire up a new one and put it back up. So that's um, probably my biggest forte is painting Um, walls. I've had painters come through my house for other um, things and they're like, oh, who'd you have paint this wall? It's pretty good. I said, oh, that'd be me. They're like, hmm you did better than some of the guys on my crew. And I was like, "Uh uh-huh, this is exactly why I do this myself. Um, And there's actually a picture. (laughs) There's actually a picture in the book of me doing DIY with my dad. So. Wow. Yeah. I I mean, the, the reason I brought it up too is because this is the thing we talk about, about moving forward. You've got oh. projects, you're moving forward, you're not living in pity party, you're not living with negative Nancy, and I apologise if everyone's name is Nancy, um, but, you know, but it, it, you're, you're moving forward, you've made projects. Like you said, you were someone who was always on her game. This is what I'm doing, this is where I'm going, this is what I'm doing, this is where I'm going. Tick. 
this is what I'm doing, this is where I'm going. And I think that really helps instead of being a chicken without a head, not knowing where you're going or exactly or believing believing that fear fear will kill you before cancer I believe that because that's what I had mm. and it stops you from moving forward and it you know it, you didn't say well this is something that my mum had yeah I'm 45 you know I'm now I'm, I'm good now but hey I better not accomplish anything because it may come back and I might be you know 10 feet under you yeah. actually keep making projects you keep creating goals for yourself because it really helps you get through what you went through right and to move forward to move forward with like you said with such grace yeah such gratitude such grace and you just keep moving forward into something beautiful and I and I really can't wait to um yeah to learn more about you I you know I think you're you're such a beautiful layered blossom flower whatever you want to call yourself because it's just got so many layers and I think what we touched on was just just the outer beautiful ones I think if we go in there's some more um amazing things now I loved having you on my podcast I really do I generally say that uh with all my guests but I do because I learn something from you ladies I learn I take away goodness I take away so much appreciation um and so much knowledge you know, I become, I sit here and I become the student to the teachers that are talking their their um, their stories. So I really love that. Now, is there anything you wanted to talk about? I mean, I'm going to have the link to your book, How to Get a Free Boob Job. I'm going to have all that available for our listeners and our viewers in the links below. Um, but is there anything else you wanted to talk about or touch on? Yeah, so one thing that I would love to extend to your listeners is a little handout that I made called 17 Ways to Spark Joy. And they are activities um, and ideas that you can accomplish in 10 minutes or less that will take your mind if it is going down a path it shouldn't or you can't figure out how to pull yourself out of um, somewhere you don't want to be you can pull out this and just pick one and do it and you know it's kind of like shiny object syndrome right sometimes we need a shiny object yeah. to take our attention away Absolutely. from something that we're dealing with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so uh, I will definitely uh, provide you a link so that your listeners have full access to this it's completely free um, it's just a little resource of things that I have done in the past that have absolutely brought me joy um, in a time when I needed a little pick-me-up Oh, I love that. I love that. And I think, uh, like I said, I'll have the link below so they can access it. And I think it's really important to do that too, is just to have some reminders. If, you, if you're a little bit stuck, like you said, I'm a little bit stuck, why not try one of these things to do? And it really helps you get out of that funk you're in. Um, yeah. Like we both said, this is going to be with us for the rest of our lives. So we're going to be going to medical doctors. We're going to have checkups and it's okay. It's going to be okay. We're just going to keep going forward. But if we get into that little funky mood, why not pick up something like you just said, where you just go, hang on, I need to do this. I need to, I need to feel good about myself or I need to unwind or I need to break through that fear and things like that. So I really love that. And I really appreciate your time uh, today. And, um, and as I said, I can't wait to get the book so then I can, I can read it uh, and have you on my podcast. Uh, hopefully you would love to be on my podcast again. I, and I will tell you right now, I will promise you, I will be here with bells on. I would, oh, I have you. so thoroughly enjoyed um, our time speaking and you are just such a bright light yourself. You're spunky. You've got energy <laughs> and perspective. And that is so, so needed in, in the world, this, not only just for women going through breast mm -hmm. cancer, but just, just perspective. 
you know, I love it. Thank you. Thank you. And I say the same because it's people like us that make, uh, you know, someone's journey out there a lot more better. Even if it's that one person you helped, it's one person more. Yes. And um, I really appreciate that. And like always, I hope you guys enjoyed today's podcast. I look forward to having you guys listen in on the next one. And like always, I wish you so much love and light.